Welcome to Train Engineers Newsletter Live program. I'm Jeannie Harshaw, and today we'll discuss selecting chilled water coils to meet the new ASHRAE 90.1 requirement for a 15 degree delta T. On today's program, we'll start by reviewing the details of this new requirement in ASHRAE Standard 90.1, along with some of the exceptions. Then we'll look at the process for selecting chilled water coils to meet this new requirement. And finally, we'll discuss how this impacts the design and operation of the chiller plant. Today, we have train application engineers John Murphy and Charlie Jellin to cover this topic. So John, can you start us off by reviewing this new requirement in standard 90.1? Sure, Jeannie. Beginning in its 2016 version, ASHRAE standard 90.1, the energy standard, now requires chilled water cooling coils to be designed for at least a 15 degree temperature difference between the leaving and entering a water. And the leaving water temperature must be no colder than 57 degrees at design conditions. So for example, in order for the leaving water temperature to be 57, this coil is designed for 42 degree entering chilled water. This would comply with the minimum 15 degree delta T requirement. Now sometimes it's helpful to understand the 90.1 committee's intent when a new requirement like this is added to the standard. Other than physically attending the committee meetings yourself, the best way to understand the intent is usually to read the foreword that's included when an addendum is released for public review. Here's an excerpt from the foreword that accompanied this specific addendum. In it, the committee cites a life cycle cost analysis that was published in the 2011 ASHRAE Journal. So the committee's intent was to encourage the use of coils with more heat transfer surface to achieve this higher delta T. This is because the analysis showed that designing a chill water system for a higher delta T reduced first costs due to smaller valves, piping, and pumps, and it also reduced energy costs. The results showed that the increase in fan energy due to this added coil surface was more than offset by the pump energy savings. Now it's important to note that this same article also showed that using a slightly lower chilled water supply temperature would allow for a coil selection that has no impact on the supply fan energy use. That is, no change in surface area or air pressure drop. For this case, the results showed that while the colder water does increase chiller energy use, that was more than offset by the pump energy savings. So while this is now a prescriptive requirement, like other sections of the standard, there are several exceptions listed. For example, individual fan cooling units that supply 5,000 CFM or less are exempt. So this exempts fan coils, blower coils, classroom unit ventilators, and small air handlers. According to the forward again, the committee put in this exception because most small fan coils don't have an option for an eight row coil. But as we'll see later in this ENL, an eight row coil is not necessarily needed. So it's still a good idea to select even these smaller units with a higher delta T. It's just that Stayer 90.1 does not currently require it. Also, coils that are selected with an entering chill water temperature of 50 degrees or warmer are also exempt. This exempts sensible only cooling equipment like radiant panels, chilled beams, and sensible cooling terminal units like trains cool sense. And if airflow across the coil is constant volume, the cooling coil is also exempt from this 15 degree delta T requirement. As I mentioned, the first analysis in the article assumed a coil with more surface area and therefore a higher air pressure drop. But in the VAV system they analyzed, the resulting increase in fan energy was more than offset by the pump energy savings. Like I said, the article also showed that using a slightly lower chill water temperature, there was no change in air pressure drop, so zero impact on fan energy. And the higher delta T still resulted in lower overall energy use. So I'm not sure why this exception was included. Even in a constant volume system, it's a good idea to design for a higher delta T, but standard 90.1 currently doesn't require it. So what applications does this requirement apply to? Well, mixed air, multiple zone VAV systems come to mind. They have variable airflow and are usually larger than 5,000 CFM. 
or a single zone VAV air handler, as might be used in larger zones like auditoriums, gymnasiums, or manufacturing areas, or a dedicated air system if it's designed for variable airflow. This would be the case if demand control ventilation is being implemented, for example. Thanks, John. Now, given this new requirement in the standard, next we'll look at the process for selecting chilled water coils to achieve at least a 15 degree delta T. To demonstrate, let's look at an example chilled water coil selection. This coil is installed in a mixed air VAV air handler with a design supply airflow of 7,000 CFM. The mixed air enters the coil at 8 degrees dry bulb and 67 wet bulb. And for this example, this air needs to be cooled and dehumidified to 53 degrees, leaving the coil. The entering chill water temperature is 42 degrees with a 15 degree delta T at design conditions. To select the size of this coil, let's start with a traditional sizing convention of 500 feet per minute. Now this rule of thumb was originally an attempt to strike a balance between the air handler size and energy use, while minimizing the risk of moisture carryover. If we use this rule, divide the airflow of 7,000 CFM by 500 feet per minute. This results in a coil face area of 14 square feet. So we'll select a size 14 air handler since the unit size typically represents the nominal face area of the cooling coil. Now to provide the required capacity, train selection software gives me 53 choices for this size air handler different tube diameters, fin styles, circuiting options, etc. Obviously overwhelming, so let's simplify by removing the outliers. On this chart, I plotted the air pressure drop and the water pressure drop for all 53 possible coils. Now for this application, it looks like we have plenty of choices, so I'll eliminate those with the highest pressure drops. And just focus on these down here in the green square. Now to be clear, I'm, I'm not saying you should never pick a coil with higher than a 20 foot water pressure drop or with higher than a one inch air pressure drop. It really depends on the application. But for this example, the application is not too demanding, so we have lots of options. So I'm just using these limits to help narrow the field. Now I also removed the coils with 10 rows. These deeper coils can be harder to clean. And again, where there are other options are available, we usually try to avoid using more than eight rows unless we absolutely have to to meet the required capacity. And finally, I remove those coils with a water velocity lower than two feet per second at design conditions. We'll talk more about this in a little bit. This leaves me with these 14 options. Now this coil here uses a 3 8 inch tubes, so it's the least expensive choice. If the only goal is to minimize cost, that's the cheapest option. Now, this group of coils all use half inch tubes, some with six rows, some with eight, with or without turbulators. And this last group uses five eighths inch tubes, again, six or eight rows, with or without turbs. Now, turbulators are devices inside the tubes that increase fluid turbulence, which improves heat transfer. We'll show you a picture a little later. As I mentioned, the coil with the 3 8 inch tubes is the cheapest, depicted by the light green. The darker green are the next cheapest. These are the six row half inch coils. The blue options are a little more expensive, eight rows with half inch tubes or six rows with 5 8 inch tubes. And finally, the red coils are the most expensive. These are all eight row coils. Knowing the relative cost helps me rule out some more options. For example, up here, coils with half inch tubes, why would I spend more money on eight rows for this application if I can get lower air and water pressure drop at a lower price with six rows? So I remove these. And down here, these five eighths inch tubes, why would I spend more money on eight rows if I can get lower air pressure drop at a lower cost with six rows and still have a very low water pressure drop? So now all the red options are gone. And finally, down here, I can get a lower air pressure drop and a slightly 
lower water pressure drop at the same price with those six row, five eighths inch coils. So I can rule out these eight, inch, eight row coils with half inch fins or half inch tubes also. So for this application at a 15 degree delta T, it looks like the added cost of an eight row coil is not warranted. When you add more rows to a coil in an air handler, not only does the coil get more expensive, but usually the air handler has to get longer. So there's more cost due to the added casing also. Again, this example is meant to walk you through the process, not generate hard fast rules. I'm not saying that eight row coils are never warranted. As we'll see in a little bit, they certainly have a place in higher delta T systems. Now, let's compare the options that we have left. Again, this selection is for a 15 degree delta T with 42 degree water. This first column is a six row coil with 3 8 inch tubes and turbulators. The next two columns show six row half inch coils. One has turbulators and the other does not. Notice that the turbulators allow the coil to provide the required capacity with fewer fins, 124 versus 159 fins per foot. This reduces the air pressure drop, but increases the water pressure drop. Now, whether or not this additional water pressure drop impacts the size of pumps or pump energy use depends on whether or not this coil is located in the critical circuit of the piping system. And this last column shows the six row coil with 5 8 inch tubes and turbulators. This one looks to be the best for both minimizing both air and water pressure drops. When I, when, when I add the cost of the coils to this table, you can see that it also costs more than the others. So for this example, if I want the lowest cost, I'd probably select a 3 8 inch coil in the first column. Or to get the lowest air and water pressure drop, I might select the 5 8 inch coil in column four. Or maybe one of these half inch coils to better balance cost and pressure drop. All right, John. So far, we've just been comparing coil performance at design conditions. Air versus water pressure drop versus cost and so on. And this makes sense because designing for a 15 degree delta T allows for a lower GPM and smaller valves and pipes and pumps. But another driver is to reduce pumping energy. And while standard 90.1 requires this 15 degree delta T at design conditions, part load operation also matters. If the water delta T is less than 15 degrees, we'll need to pump more GPM. So maybe we should look at part load performance of various coil options. Remember, our example is a mixed air VAV air handler. Design airflow is 7,000 CFM. At design conditions, the mixture of outdoor return air conditions results in 80 degrees dry bulb and 67 wet bulb. This is the condition of the air entering the chill water coil. In this application, the air is cooled to 53 degrees. But in a mixed air system, these entering coil conditions will change as the outdoor conditions change. And the airflow changes as well when the VV dampers modulate at part load. So to analyze how delta T is affected by part load operation, we chose two other less severe outdoor conditions when the coil will still be active. And then calculate coil performance at these three mixed air conditions at two different airflows. Now here's the six row, three eighths inch coil with turbulators. At design conditions, which is the leftmost column, the coil is selected to achieve 15 degree delta T. At the two part load entering air conditions, still with design airflow, the coil is able to maintain that delta T and even increase it. The next set of columns show the same three entering condi air conditions, but now at 75% of design airflow. Again, this coil is able to not only maintain, but increase the water delta T. Now, if I do the same analysis with the six row half inch coil without turbs, I see a different result. Now we see the delta T start to drop off at this third part load point. And in all cases, the delta T is not as high as it is with the coil with turbulators. And when I add the other two coil options to this chart, 
we see that they also do a good job of maintaining and even increasing delta T at part load. In fact, while this coil without turbulators sees a decrease in delta T, all three coils with turbulators result in very similar delta T performance at part load. Pretty similar performance at entering air condition two and full airflow, as well as entering condition three and full airflow. Here's the design entering air conditions at 75% airflow, then entering condition two at the same reduced airflow, and finally entering condition three at reduced airflow. Regardless of tube diameter, the turbulators allow these coils to maintain, in most cases increase, the delta T at part load. So when selecting coils for higher delta T systems, it seems like turbulators are a great option. They increase fluid turbulence, which improves heat transfer. This allows the coil to provide the required capacity with a lower GPM, leading to reduced pumping energy at these part load conditions. Now, Train has over 50 years of successful field experience with turbulators, with performance certified by HRI, so we know how they work. Now, before moving on, let's pause a moment to talk about water velocity. Earlier, when paring down the available coil selections, I eliminated coils in which the water velocity at design conditions was less than two feet per second. Charlie, can you talk a little bit more about that? The water velocity through the coil tubes is determined by the geometry of the coil, including the tube diameter and how the coil is circuited. Consequences of too low of water velocity include tube fouling from sediment or scaling, air trapped inside the tubes, which causes a loss of capacity, noise, or vibration, poor distribution of water in the coil, resulting in non-uniform leaving air temperatures across the face of the coil, and a higher risk of water freezing inside the tubes. On the other hand, too high of water velocity can cause the following. Erosion of the inside surfaces of the tubes, especially at the U-bends, excessive water pressure drop, and noise. Guidelines for water velocity should take into account all these risks, as well as specific requirements for the actual project. One source of guidance on water velocity is AHRI, the trade association that re represents global manufacturers of air conditioning, heating, and refrigeration equipment. Most coil manufacturers rate and certify their coil performance selection programs using AHRI standard 410, 410. This standard establishes a single set of testing and rating requirements for determining capacity, as well as air and water pressure drops for cooling and heating coils. This provides design engineers with an apples-to-apples -apples comparison of coil performance from different manufacturer to manufacturer. For cooling coils, AHRI requires selections to have a water velocity between 1 and 8 feet per second and this maximum velocity is lowered to six feet per second for coils using glycol. Selecting within this range will ensure that the variation between your predicted performance and your actual performance is minimal. However, it's still possible to accurately rate coil performance both above and below these velocities. Another source of recommendations, the ASHRAE Handbook, suggests that cooling coils are best selected with water velocities between two and four feet per second. Water pressure drop is often a defining characteristic between a good coil selection and a bad coil selection. So this velocity range is meant to provide a good balance between coil size and minimizing both air and water pressure drops, as well as the other risk factors I mentioned earlier. Water velocity is also important because it's one of the key factors for determining flow turbulence along with fluid density and viscosity and the tube diameter. As the turbulence of the moving fluid increases, so does its ability to transfer heat from the tube wall to the fluid and vice versa. Now, some in the HVAC industry express the concern that coil heat transfer will deteriorate if the Reynolds number falls into this laminar flow region. Now, back in 2015, we produced an ENL on coil selection and optimization. And on it, we interviewed a 20-year veteran of the AHRI 410 Engineering Committee to debunk this concern. And he showed how the AHRI prediction methodology was refined in 2001, 
allowing coils to be accurately rated well into the laminar flow region without fear of large discrepancies between your predicted and your actual performance. To demonstrate, this chart plots coil capacity on the y-axis versus water flow rate and Reynolds number on the x-axis. This blue line is the current performance model implemented in the 2001 version of HRI 410. Now note that this does show a slight dip in capacity that is less linear than the rest of the coil performance, but nothing drastic. In summary, laminar flow does not cause a severe drop off in capacity. And the HRI prediction methods allow coils to be rated accurately well into the transitional and laminar flow regions. Okay, let's get back to our example selection. After walking through the coil selection process for a higher delta T, how does it differ from selecting coils with a 10 degree delta T? Here I've kept only the half inch coils from the previous example, and now I'm comparing those to a six row coil selected with a 10 degree delta T and a 44 degree entering water temperature. Of course, the first impact of this new 15 degree delta T requirement is that the larger delta T reduces the water flow rate from 60 GPM down to 40 GPM in this example. As we mentioned, this reduces the size of valves, pipes, and pumps, as well as pump energy use. But in order to achieve this 15 degree delta T, some designers may choose to select the coil with more fins as depicted in the first column. For this example, the fin density has to be increased from 127 to 159 fins per foot to provide the required capacity with a higher delta T. As you can see, this will increase air pressure drop from 0.82 to 0.95 inches, and also increase the cost of the coil. Or other designers may choose to select the coil with turbulators, as depicted in the second column. This will increase the water pressure drop from 9.9 .9 to 11.1 to feet, but reduces the air pressure drop since it requires fewer fins. And again, the cost of the coil does cost more. So what's different? Coils will likely be selected with more coil surface area, or we'll see an increase in the use of turbulators. Okay, John. So far, you've been showing selections with 42 degree water to meet this 15 degree delta T requirement. But you could also choose warmer water temperatures, correct? That's right. ASHRAE 90.1 requires that the leaving water temperature be no colder than 57 degrees, so it can be warmer. Let's look at some coil selections where the water enters at 45 degrees and leaves at 60, which also meets the minimum 15 degree delta T requirement. For this example, as we see in columns three and four, eight rows of coil tubes are required to provide the needed capacity with these warmer supply water temperatures. The result is a much higher air pressure drop and water pressure drop than the six row coils using 42 degree water. And not only will the coils cost more, the air handler will likely need to be longer, which increases the cost of the casing as well. Making the chiller work a little harder to make the 42 degree water versus 45 in this example is likely more efficient than making the fans and pumps both work harder to overcome these higher pressure drops. Along this same line, note the standard 90.1 requires the delta T to be 15 degrees or higher. There are many in the industry who recommend delta T's even higher than 15. In fact, the article I mentioned earlier, which was the basis for adding this new requirement, recommends a 25 degree delta T. Here, the first column is for my first example, with the 42 degree entering water and 15 degree delta T. The second column also uses 42 degree water, but with a 20 degree delta T. And the third column uses 40 degree water with a 25 degree delta T. Again, the larger delta T reduces the water flow rate even further, from 40 down to 30 or 24 GPM in this example. And it also reduces the water pressure drop. But in this case, the higher delta T required more coil surface area, so air pressure drop 
does increase. Okay, before we move on to the chiller plant, let me say one more thing about air pressure drop. As I mentioned earlier, the standard 90.1 committee stated in the forward to this addendum that their intent was to encourage the use of coils with more heat transfer surface to achieve this higher delta T. And as we've seen today, in some cases, this might result in a higher air pressure drop. ASHRAE 62.1, the ventilation standard, includes a requirement that is meant to ensure that coils can be properly cleaned. Deeper coils with more rows and coils with a higher density of fins can be more challenging to clean. The Standard 62 Committee addressed this issue by prescribing a limit on the coil's air pressure drop as a surrogate measure for cleanability. In other words, coils with higher air pressure drops are in general more difficult to clean properly. So this standard requires that the air pressure drop of a fin tube coil cannot exceed 0.75 inches of water. But notice that this is at a specific air velocity and the limit is based on the pressure drop when the coil is dry, not when it's dehumidified. Going back to our example selection, the entering air conditions are 80 degrees dry bulb and 67 wet bulb. This equates to a 60 degree dew point. Now this air is being cooled to 53 degrees, which means that water vapor will be condensing out of the air and onto the coil surface. So the air pressure drops I've been showing are all for a wet coil, not dry. In order to check to see if a selected coil complies with this requirement of ASHRAE 62, you can use the manufacturer's selection software and rerun the performance of the selected coil, but change the entering air conditions so that the coil will run dry. In this case, by lowering the entering air wet bulb from 67 down to 55 degrees, the entering dew point drops to 30, well below the coil surface temperature. So at these conditions, the coil will operate dry with no condensation. Now here, the first column is one of the six row coils from my previous example, the 15 degree delta T. The air pressure drop is 0.95 inches. But again, this is when the coil is wet. The second column shows the exact same coil where the entering wet bulb is changed and lowered to 55 degrees so the coil will operate dry. Note that I also changed the air flow slightly so that the air velocity is exactly 500 feet per minute. Under these dry conditions, at the prescribed air velocity, the air pressure drop is 0.7 inches. So this coil does comply with the standard 62 limit on air pressure drop. Thanks, guys. Now let's finish the CNL by discussing how selecting cooling coils for a higher delta T impacts the design and operation of the chiller plant. Charlie? I'm going to take a look at three different chiller plant considerations when moving your coils to 15 degree delta T's. The first is looking at what a 15 degree delta T does to chiller turndown. Now let's assume you're designing a variable primary flow chiller plant. One of the critical values that you need to address is the chiller's minimum evaporator flow. So the first thing I want to take a look at is the impact on chiller hydronic turndown when we go from a 10 degree delta T to a 15 degree delta T. So to ground everyone, hydronic turndown is how far can we reduce the chiller's water flow before we hit the chiller's minimum evaporator flow. This value is commonly described as a ratio of design flow to minimum flow, or a percent flow reduction. In this quick example, our design flow is 1,000 GPM, and our minimum flow is 500 GPM. This gives us a turndown of 2 to 1, or a 50% flow reduction. For a variable primary flow system, a minimum 2 to 1 turndown is a good starting point. There are a couple reasons we like to see at least a 2 to 1 turndown. First, and most important, if the plant is operating with poor chiller turndown, sequencing those chillers becomes a lot harder. Whenever there is a transition, that is a chiller is added or subtracted, the system must operate to maintain the minimum flow rate through the evaporators of all the operating chillers. With poor flow turndown, the bypass valve must open both during and after transitions. The second reason we recommend a 2 to 1 turndown is pumping energy. 
Remember, the pump horsepower drops by about the cube of the reduction in flow rate. So a 50% reduction in flow provides about an 85% reduction in pump power. Okay, getting back to the impact of switching to a 15 degree delta T. The first piece of advice I can give you is do not use a 10 degree delta T chiller selection. Reselect the chiller for 15 degrees and make sure you get the turn down, the pressure drop, and the efficiency you're looking for. To drive this point home, I'll show you a couple examples of what a 15 degree delta T does to a 10 degree delta T chiller selection. The first, the first chiller we'll look at is a 500 ton water cooled centrifugal. Now, most centrifugal chillers are highly configurable, which gives the designer the ability to specify and get exactly the turn down, the pressure drop, and the efficiency they're looking for. Here's an example, and I'll start with a, a really basic selection, just a 10 degree delta T and a design flow of 1200 GPM. The minimum flow for this specific chiller is 340 GPM. The pressure drop is about 14 feet and provides a really good 3.5 to 1 turndown or a 71% flow reduction. So let's say the engineer wants at least a 2.5 to 1 turndown and also needs to comply with ASHRAE 90.1 2016. Taking this exact same chiller but running at a 15 degree delta T, we can see the design flow rate reduces but the minimum stays the same, right? it's the exact same chiller. This results in a flow turndown of 2.3 to 1, or only a 57% flow reduction. Now to get the chillers turned down back up, there are a lot of options available to chiller manufacturers. They can use different diameter tubes, they can use different internal tube enhancements, they can add or remove tubes, or even modify the number of water passes. First, we'll look at just removing tubes. Manufacturers commonly have multiple discrete tube bundles for any given evaporator. So if we hold the GPM through the chiller the same and only decrease the number of tubes, the water velocity will increase through those tubes. This velocity increase will decrease the chiller's minimum flow and provide more turndown. You can see in this example, we're able to achieve a 2.9 to 1 turn bound just by reducing the number of tubes. Another option would be to go from a two-pass evaporator to a three-pass evaporator. Here you can see the minimum flow rate decreases even further, which provides a great turndown of 3.5 to 1. Now the pressure drop in this selection goes up to 21 feet at design flow, which for a variable primary flow system is completely fine, and we commonly see design pressure drops around 30 feet ahead. The reason the design pressure drop can be higher at design for a variable primary flow system is because the pressure drop is decreasing by the square of the flow rate. So when your building is at part load, which is going to be most of the time, the pressure drop in the system is dropping quickly. Right. Now in general, centrifugal chillers are configurable enough to get the proper turndown for a variable primary flow system. But not all chillers are this configurable. Let's move over to air-cooled screw and scroll chillers and see what impact a 15 degree delta T has on them. The example here is a 50 ton air-cooled chiller with a braze plate heat exchanger. These small air-cooled chillers are probably the least configurable product in terms of evaporator selection. You can see the original design here, 5242 on the EVAP, with a design flow of 120 GPM. The minimum flow for this chiller is 65 GPM, which gives us a flow turndown of 1.8 to 1, or a 46% flow reduction. Let's see what happens if we use the exact chiller and only reduce the flow rate to get a 15 degree delta T, 57 entering, 42 leaving. You can see the design flow obviously reduces, but the minimum flow stays the same. It's the same chiller at 65 GPM. Our flow turndown drops all the way to 1.2 to 1, and this is well below our recommended 2 to 1 turndown for variable primary flow systems. To understand why poor chiller turndown is detrimental to a variable primary flow system, let's look at a quick example. Here's the chiller we just looked at. It's a 50 ton air cooled chiller and we've put it into a variable primary flow pumping arrangement. This chiller has limited turndown, 1.2 to 1, meaning we can only reduce the flow by 
or down to 65 GPM in this example. If the building load requires anything less than 65 GPM, the bypass valve will open and bypass the amount of water needed to maintain that chiller's minimum flow. In this example, let's say the building load requires 20 GPM, which is 20% of the building design load. So we need to bypass 45 GPM to maintain the chiller's minimum flow. Essentially, we're penalizing the pumps whenever the building load is below 80%, which for most applications is going to be the majority of your run hours. Instead of going variable primary, let's look at a variable primary, variable secondary system. Because the pumping is now decoupled, the distribution pumps are allowed to freely unload and match the building load. In this example, you can see the distribution pumps can go all the way down to 20 GPM instead of 65 GPM in the variable primary system. Only the primary pumps are penalized by the high minimum flow of 65 GPM. Now to quantify the benefits of this, let's compare energy consumption between a couple of these different pumping configurations. I'm going to switch the example up a little bit. I'm going to make the chillers bigger, and I'm going to add a second chiller. We're going to look at three different pumping systems. First is variable primary, second primary secondary, and last variable primary variable secondary. All three systems will have two 250-ton air-cooled chillers with a system delta T of 15 degrees and a max hydronic turndown of 1.2 to 1. Again, that means we can only reduce the flow by 17% from design. The first comparison we'll look at is total pumping power based on plant load. So your x-axis here is going to be your plant load, and the y-axis is going to be your pump kW. First is variable primary. You can see two large plateaus of pumping power. This is the effect of having a high minimum flow. As the building load decreases from both 90% to 55%, and from 45% to 5%, the system needs to bypass flow to maintain the chiller's minimum flow. The next pumping configuration is primary secondary. You can see the impact of being able to reduce the distribution pump, GPM, to match the building load. Finally, variable primary, variable secondary. The pump profile follows the same trend as primary secondary, but further reduces the primary GPM to save slightly more pump KW. Now, looking at this graph, it's easy to see that because of poor chiller turndown, there are numerous plant loads where a variable primary flow configuration will cost you energy. How much energy depends on your specific installation. And to give you an idea, we analyzed the load profile developed by Pacific Northwest National Labs for an office building in St. Louis to come up with an annual pump KWH comparison. Again, this graph is showing plant load on the x-axis, but now we'll compare KWH for the entire year. The variable primary flow system consumed almost 29,000 KWH. The primary secondary consumed 19% less pump energy over the course of the year, and the variable primary, variable secondary configuration consumed the least amount of energy at about 20,000 kWh, which is 32% less pump energy than a variable primary flow configuration. Now remember, this configuration, this comparison, assumes the chillers have very limited turndown, which is going to penalize the variable primary flow system. If designed properly, a variable primary flow system can be a very efficient system choice. All right. What all this means is you have flexibility to design efficient systems. If you have a chiller with a high minimum flow, and the chiller itself cannot be modified in order to support a VPF system design, choose a different pumping configuration. On the other hand, if you want a variable primary flow system, push the manufacturer to supply or develop a chiller that meets your system requirements. Now one last thing before we move on. If you find yourself in a situation where you have a variable primary flow system and the chillers on the project have a high minimum flow, not all is lost. This is the graph we just looked at for pump KW for a variable primary flow system with increasing system load. Again, the areas marked here by bypass flow is where the bypass valve needs to open to maintain minimum chiller flow. 
the pump KW plateaus because no matter what the building load is, we need to pump the same GPM to maintain that minimum flow. In this situation, chilled water reset can be a great energy saving strategy. In fact, chill water temperature reset based on valve position is a prescriptive requirement in ASHRAE 90.1 whenever the system is larger than 25 tons. Now the reason chilled water reset makes sense at these pump KW plateaus is because you have no ability to save pump energy, so you might as well try to save some chiller energy. Resetting the chilled water temperature up allows the chiller to operate at lower lift, saving energy, while pumping the same amount of GPM through the system. Let me show you a quick example. Here is the variable primary flow system we've been talking about with two 250-ton air-cooled chillers, both with poor turndown. The chillers can each produce 400 GPM of 42-degree water at design, and we'll assume the building load is at 25%, so one chiller is turned off. Now let's assume 100 GPM of 42-degree water is required to satisfy the coil loads. That means we need to bypass 230 GPM to maintain the chiller's minimum flow. Now, let's apply chilled water reset to this system and see what happens. We'll reset the chilled water set point to 44 degrees. Since the coils still need to offset the same load in the building, but now with warmer water, we'll need to pump more water to those coils. Instead of 100 GPM to the coils, this example requires 130 GPM, which means we'll bypass slightly less flow at 200 GPM. Since the chiller's minimum doesn't change, the overall system pumping energy is exactly the same. However, resetting the chilled water temperature saves around 1 to 2% per degree of lift reduction, which means we could save around 4% of the chiller's energy in this example. Okay, we covered a lot there. Let's talk about some takeaways from this section. I've got two. First, if you're designing a variable primary flow chiller plant, regardless of the delta T, make sure you get proper chiller turndown. Minimum two to one is a good starting point. Second, if you cannot achieve good chiller turndown, look to primary secondary or variable primary variable secondary to achieve efficient plant operation. Okay, moving on to the next topic. I want to look at mixed systems. And what I mean by a mixed system is a combination of different coil types. Let's say air handlers and fan coils. One of the exceptions that John mentioned earlier to the 15 degree coil delta T requirement is if you're using a small fan coil terminal unit. These units are typically selected for 7 to 10 degree delta T's, but there are fan coils available on the market that can achieve higher delta T's. But historically, 7 to 10 is what most of these manufacturers supply. Now let's assume that 75% of your coil loads are from air handlers with 15 degree delta T's that comply with 90.1 2016 and 25% are eight degree fan coils that also comply with 90.1 2016 per the exception. The mixed return water temperature will be about 55 degrees at design. So the chiller plant will see a 13 degree delta T instead of 15 degree delta T, which is okay. In this situation, you'd select the chiller for the required system flow and a 13 degree delta T. Remember, the requirement in 90.1 2016 is specifically for the coil, not the chillers. The last topic I'm going to cover is designing for a variable delta T. Maybe you have a mixture of two-way and three-way valves, or maybe you want to overpump a chiller in a variable primary flow system, or maybe you're planning on doing chilled water reset. Any of these can result in less than designed delta T during operation. So here is a potential way to make sure you have enough pump to handle a lower delta T. Take the design chiller here, 4257 with 250 GPM of water at 10 feet of pressure drop. If you take that exact same chiller and you ran it at the design tonnage, but you lowered the delta T to 12 degrees, 5442, you'd end up with 290 GPM of flow at 14 and a half feet of pressure drop. So you'd still size the coils for 15 degree delta T, but you could use the 290 GPM and the increased evaporator pressure drop to make sure you'll have enough pump to handle a variable delta T design. Thanks guys. So in summary, ASHRAE 90.1 now requires cooling coils to be selected 
for a minimum 15 degree delta T, but there are exceptions. The larger delta T reduces the water flow rate, which allows for the use of smaller valves, pipes, and pumps, and reduces pump energy use. This will likely lead designers to either select coils with more surface area or with turbulators. And as we saw, turbulators allow coils to maintain or even increase delta T at part load, which leads to pump energy savings. And designing the system with a slightly lower chilled water temperature may allow these coils to be selected with little or no impact on fan energy use. And finally, when selecting chillers for higher delta Ts, Pay close attention to the amount of flow turndown a chiller can achieve. If the turndown is poor, consider the impact on your pumping system and design the plant accordingly. We hope you enjoyed this ENL program and that you found it a helpful way to learn about selecting chilled water coils and designing the chiller plant for higher delta T. As always, the bibliography included in your handout provides more information on where to find a number of resources related to today's topic. Or contact your local train account manager for specific information on train systems and controls. And for those of you seeking continuing education credit, be sure to check out our continuing education programs, which include many past DNLs, all free and on demand. And please remember to fill out a survey and let us know what you thought of today's program. AA members, please turn in your information to your local site coordinator. And finally, ask your local host about details for the remaining Engineers Newsletter Live programs this year. Thanks for your time today. We look forward to seeing you next time.